I'm not going to lie to (laughs) y'all. It is a hot day outside. And I came in being like, I need something to cool me off and make me feel good. And guess what? (laughs) Here we are. (laughs) Hey, it's Romania Black. We are on episode eight of Life Lessons with Urumichi Oni-san. And I'm pretty excited about that because... It is the infamous rule of eight. If you don't know what rule of eight is on my channel, if you have a series, my hypothesis, my theory is that if you have a series that is between 11, 12, or 13 episodes, the eighth episode is always good. Always. There's only been one case that's been mildly wrong and it was like Attack on Titan season two, but we're going to avoid that. (laughs) But in that season, and that episode was fine in that season, but Every other series that I have watched where it's been 11 to 13 episodes, the eighth episode is always either really plot important or it's very, very entertaining. And I think the reason for that is because if you go by the three act structure in stories, you have a beginning, middle, and an end. The eighth episode is right in that end of the second act beginning of the third act so like you you've got to know the characters you've got the conflicts of all of them and now you're making that transition to the final arc of the season where things are going to go down so usually it's like that turning point so knowing that we're going into the eighth episode with this i'm so excited now the question is is the eighth episode rule of eight going to work for a series like Uramichi Oni-san that's more episodic and hasn't really had a through thread. I mean, I guess as you watch each episode, the plot builds and builds and the existential crises build and build and the weight and burden of their depression builds and builds with these characters. But there's not really been like, you know, a thing that we're working towards or like any type of plot that we're building towards. So full disclaimer, Romania could be wrong. And the rule of eight may not apply to this series. But either way, even if it doesn't, I'm super excited about this episode because it's Uramichi Oni-san. And this show has been so fun. It's been so hilarious. It has been eye-opening, relatable. Even the parts that are depressing and sad, I can watch this series as my dogs go crazy. And... I think that there is, I think that my dog Huckleberry is having his own Urimichi Onisan moment because there's a groundhog that's right outside where I live and it has been taunting him for weeks now. And so if you hear him just go crazy and bark for no reason, it's probably because he can see the groundhog. The groundhog's not bothered, but (laughs) he very much is. So I feel all the time like Huckleberry is... Every pose that we've seen Urumichi in, Huckleberry is that pose. So he's he's constantly neurotic all the time. Ruby's just living. Ruby, if Ruby was a character on this show, my other dog, she would be Ikateru. She's just like got a little onigiri coming out her brain all the time. And Urumichi would be um, Huckleberry. So maybe that's why I ship them. <laughs> Although I've been shipping Ikateru more with Kuma these last several uh, weeks just because the ship is so strong. So anyway... I'm really excited to see what we get in this episode. I hope you all are too, but ignore my dogs. If they bark, they don't mean anything bad. But with that being said, I'm excited. Let's not waste any more time. We are going to dive right into episode eight of Life Lessons with Urumichi Oni-san. And we are going to do that here in three, two, one. And let's, let's, let us, let us begin. I came to this show for the humor first and the existential crisis second, but not every week can be that week. (laughs) I, I also didn't expect to cry in this series or nearly cry, but here we are. Oh my God. Oh, so at first I was like, when we were about halfway through the episode, I was going, Oh, right well maybe I was wrong about the rule of eight and then we got to the whole father's day event and I was like oh so first of all kudos to all of you for not spoiling that little plot twist because several episodes back when the one kid was like he had like crouched down he was like he's like oh thank you Uramichi for for you know doing this I got to my dad's gonna come to the concert and see you all I was like oh that's really cute but they focused on it a lot and I was like 
And they really focused on how Urumichi reacted to the kid telling him that his dad was able to take him to concert. And so I didn't quite, it didn't quite hit me that Urumichi would have a strained relationship with his dad. It didn't hit me at all. And then this episode happens and suddenly a lot of things make more sense. So the rule of eight, we're, we're burning into, we're swerving into the final act of this season. And now Urumichi's behavior, his view on why he has this job with these kids, it all is starting to make more sense. And Kumau is starting to notice that Urumichi, that there's something behind all of it with him. Kumau's like, Kumau's pretty perceptive. I'd say that of all of them, Kumau and Tadano are probably the two most perceptive. I feel like she would be more perceptive if she wasn't so focused on the ennui of her ongoing struggles with her boyfriend. I feel like if she wasn't so consumed by that, she would have noticed a lot more things as well. Usao and Ikateru, hopeless. <laughs> notice anything so it's really down to it's really down to come out maybe Us, maybe usahara will notice things but everybody's got their problems right now in this episode right we focused a little bit more on usahara than anybody else at this point but i there's so much in this episode that they talk about that we can break down just a little bit. Like for example, Urumichi being super excited and like over hyperactive. And we find out later it's to compensate for the fact that his back is hurting him. And I'm like, oh no, I don't, I, I was wondering if we were gonna get into like the sports background. And I feel like we're going to by the end of this because with this potential injury that he has, I'm thinking that he might have some PTSD from, you know, his days as a gymnast where maybe he was injured and wasn't able to perform anymore or, or compete anymore. And so he had to quit. And knowing that his father seems to have been a super competitive sports person as well, that was all about him training. I'm like, if he had to quit being a gymnast and he's estranged from his dad because of that, I'm like, oh no. So there's that whole deal that could go along with it. I'm like, that's, that's not good. Not good, Cotton. So I'm a little worried about that, which is exciting. <laughs> um, but also the idea of when you watch Urumichi in all of these episodes now and see him and how he trains so much, it's like part of that regimen from when he was a kid has kept with him and he still does it. It's like part of him, whether he realizes it or not. And it's like, oh my God. So there's a lot there to unpack, right? But when he talks to the kids, he's like, you know, when you get to be my age, he says the allegation of your mood throughout the day is pretty much set in stone. That's so true. I feel like sometimes we get like, um, when we go to work, there are certain times of the day that you feel your best and there's certain times of the day you feel your worst or your least productive. I feel like I am most productive, like either early in the morning, right when I get there, or like you get a second wind right after, right after lunch, you get a second wind and you're like, okay, my stomach's full. Now I can do some things, but right about like right before lunch. And then right at like the four o'clock mark, I'm like, I'm out, checked out, we're done. And so I like the idea that he kind of, you know, brings this up to the kids being like, it's to protect your body from collapsing by accidentally going beyond your limits. And the kids are all like, what? But that feature can sometimes cause a malfunction. <laughs> and he's like, see, I'm allocating my, my mood wrongly today. And 70% of my energy will be used up by the morning. And they're like, you're going to die, oni -san. He's like, don't worry. I can pull this off because I'm an adult. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And he has like the dead eyed look in his face, like as he's telling them all. I like that they've kept using the same kids throughout the show where you can kind of see certain kids in the audience and know who they are. Like the kid with the K, uh, Kos Kotsky. Like I think he was in a previous episode because I saw that hoodie with the K on it. The only one that's new is the general manager's grandson. Oh my God. Of course, the general manager's grandson. We'll talk about that whole dang scene. That was a thing but yeah so basically i like that urumichi is kind of like used for he actually does something really smart here with the kids where the one kid is being excluded and the other kids kids are savages by the way savages the, even if they don't mean anything vicious they're savages like the one kid doesn't want to play and they're like well just leave him leave him alone but urumichi's like no that will just cause problems and he's he's viewing it not only from a personal level that we can't leave this kid behind, but he's also thinking of it on a professional level being like, we can't 
get the show a going and keep it up if all you kids start bailing. So I like his method of he doesn't yell at the kid. He doesn't like grab the kid. He, he puts his hand on his shoulders, but that's after the fact. But he sits down beside the kid like Forrest Gump sitting down watching TV with his kid. And he basically says, you know, I sometimes go through the same thing. But, you know, when you're an adult, you know, you don't get the luxury of having people ignore you. You have to keep doing this. So he basically tells the kid, like, if we want to keep having this show, you're going to have to get your butt in gear. But he says it in a way that one thing I like about Urmichi is he never treats the kids like they're dumb. He doesn't. He, he treats the kids like they're kids, but he doesn't treat them like they don't understand. He's very forward and very open with them. And I think that's really important. I like that he does that, right? I think that that's smart. And the kid, of course, by the time, by the time Urmichi is done having his peace and staying with them, both the kid Kotsky and like the other kids are like, oh, Never mind. <laughs> we'll we'll go. It's fine. You just don't don't stress yourself, Rumichi. We'll we'll play together. And he's like, you know, one day you'll realize you were very lucky <laughs> that people left you alone. He's like, okay, I'll play. And he's like, oh look, he wants to play now. We're all good, right? <laughs> and so then he's like, how about we call out Usao and Kumao Kun? <laughs> And they're just such good friends. I love whenever he brings them up, there's this little icy layer of sarcasm where he's like, let's bring them out. And it's like, <laughs> so they call them. And of course, they're not listening because Kumatani and Usahara are having a, a conversation. And so we get a little bit more about Usahara in this. Usahara has a gambling problem. And they kind of have brushed it aside for the most part in this series, but they finally bring it back up and they're like, yeah, he's got a gambling problem and now he can't pay his rent. And Kuma is like, look, you owe me 20,000 yen, which how much is 20,000 yen? I want to do the yen to USD, which I know the, the difference, it, it fluctuates, but $124. So he's like, you owe me $124 already. So I'm not giving you any more money. And, and you know, on the one hand, I would say, you know, if you're best friends with someone, you, you should loan them the money and, and they'll pay you back, sure. But these are also like struggling actors on a kid's show. They're probably not getting paid a lot anyway. And Kuma's like, you already owe me 120 bucks. If I keep giving you more money, you need to pay me back. And also you need to figure out what you're gonna do, right? I feel like Kuma is going to wants him to try to like tackle the actual problem, which is his, he's like, it's your own fault in the first place. He's like, you're sure to run out of money at some point if you keep just gambling it away. He's like, you still owe me 20,000 yen. And then Uzahara's like, oh, you remembered that? And he's like, yes, I did. So on the one hand, while I would like Kuma to loan him the money, we as the audience don't know like how often has Usahara been in this position? Has he been kicked out a lot? what has ended up happening before he made the comment about living with Usa come. I think, I don't know. I can't remember if he made the comment about living with Kumau or if he was talking about, um, about just the fact that he was like, you're my best friend. I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, now it's coming up and he's like, well, we're best friends, right? Aren't we best friends? And he's like, they're the last words you should use. Kuma's basically like, don't rely on that whole best friends gig as a crutch when you need to sort out your own problems. You're an adult, you need to figure it out. He's like, you need to figure out how you're going to pay rent and quit gambling. And so he's like, why don't you just borrow from Urmichi san And I like how he's like, do you want me to die? <laughs> he's like, Urmichi wouldn't loan me money. And then he talks about when they lived back at the college dorms together, which I instantly was like, oh, are we going to do a flashback? I was wanting a flashback so badly i was like will you please give me a flashback and they don't do it and i was like i was really hoping for it but no tough luck because he's like it was so easy back then to get together for drinking and he's like yeah because we were all probably splitting the bill and then when he was like scratching his butt and saying it's a pain to go to urmichi's place urmichi's like i didn't recall asking you to come over <laughs> And the way I love every time, it's always Uzahara that does it, which you could say furthers the ship, however you want to say it. But every time, Urumichi, there, there's like fake smile Urumichi, there's dead shark eyes Urumichi. But then sometimes, whenever like he's getting onto Usahara, there's this like malicious gleam in his eyes, and it's kind of terrifying. I'm just like, oh my god. 
it is so damn funny. He's like, he's like, he's like, I've been calling your name for several times now. Why aren't you out yet? And then Usahara is an idiot because it's like, Kuma's like, now's not the time. We're at work. And the first thing he does is he asks Urumichi to loan him the money for rent. And he goes, no. He's like, you've got some nerve asking in this type of situation. He doesn't say no, though. He said, you got some nerve, but he didn't say no. And then he like grips. You could just see the hand gripping, dragging him onto the stage. The fact that you only see the bunny costume and the little tiny bunny nose makes him look like he's just doing this like the whole time. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. And I love that they just play up the fact that he might be gone because he can't pay rent. And the kids are like, oh no, where do you live? What are you going to do? And he's like, Usao is a bad boy, so he might be kicked out soon. And they're like, poor thing. They'll be like, it'll be tough for Usao. And, like, all the kids, like, volunteer to, like, let him stay at their house or in their dog park. And he's just so, like, he's just like, oh, really, everybody? And so then Urumichi, for a second, looks like he's moved. But that's when he's like, these innocent children. And he just throws Usahara under the bus in this moment. He's just like, these kids... If they took you in, you would be teaching them how to gamble their life savings away, wasting money on pachinko, or they could get drunk after being rejected in a group date, or end up sleeping in the street and getting questioned by the police to think what might become of them in their future like that. It just makes the tears well up. And I love that Usahara's like, dude, like, what are, what are you talking about? And Kamal's like, he's talking about you. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. So then... We have the two girl characters. We have to pass the Blechdel test in there. The two girl characters. The one girl character with the blonde hair, she's talking about this, like, detox water, I guess, to give a uh, detox tea to give to Dono so that she's, you know, if she's hungover. <laughs> ha! Which seems to happen quite a bit. And then poor Urumichi. Like, the director keeps asking him to come to, like, their rap parties. And they're like, aren't you going to come to the drinking party after this? And he's like, no. He's like, if possible, I'd like to go home. And Kumau is observant. Kumau has been watching Ikateru and he's watching Uramichi now. Like, Kumau is the sanest one of the group and he's watching Uramichi because he knows something's up. He's like, mm, okay, what are we going to do? And then meanwhile, Usari's like, what are you going to do about your rent? And Usari's like, mm, he's like, I know, I'll ask, I'll ask Ikateru for money. And Ikateru is so sweet that he's like, lend me some money, please. And Ikateru's like, okay, sure. And they're like, no! They're like, he's using you. And the way, the way that Tadano and Kumal tell him no for Ikateru to not loan Usahara any money. And then the way that Kumal like gives him a head rub and he's like, you worry me so much. <laughs> you really do. Like he's a damn dog. I can't. I can't with this. I can't with that ship. I just, it's too much. It's too much. Because Ikateru's like, what did I do? And Kumal's like, I have to worry about you so much. <laughs> I love it. So he's like, kids, try to plan ahead and be organized, okay? It very much felt like when, when Urumichi said that, it felt like a Sonic Says moment where he's like, don't gamble. <laughs> or Sailor Moon Says. <laughs> and then we go from there. Hilarious. So then, makes sense Uzahara. Uzahara getting mad because he wasn't invited out drinking when he can't afford rent. I'm sorry, but what were you going to do? Just sit there? I guess he could have came and just ate their food. I guess he could have done that, but I don't know. I can't be mad at Usahara for being like, why didn't you invite me? Because I've had friends before too that were like, hey, can you spot me for dinner and I'll pay you back later? And I've been like, yeah, sure, that's fine. So I can't be mad at him. Also, the place that they're eating at looks amazing. I would eat there in a heartbeat. That zucchini and steak look really, really good. I like that we get Kuma that we get uh, Kumatani and Urumichi having conversations. I, I really like that. I like them both having this adult conversation together. And Kumatani talks about not wanting to be corrupted. He doesn't want to overlook despicable things that he can't agree with. He's like, he doesn't want to just let them go. And Urumichi's like, well, do I look corrupted to you? And he's like, I don't know, but you look like you're putting up with a lot of things. Kumatani's basically like, if I've got a problem, I'm going to address it and just move on. He's like, you look like you're putting up with a lot of stuff. And that's bothering you. And he's like, well, I can't say that I'm not putting up with stuff. But he's like, I, I hurt my lower back. And then, of course, Kumatani's like, well, what were you doing? And he's like, well, 
He's like, I was like overworking out and I didn't notice. And by the time I noticed, my back was hurting. And then he says the barbell was twice as heavy as my usual one. It happens a lot, right? And Kumatani's like, no, normally it doesn't. He's like, don't start saying that things are normal when they're not. He's like, he's like, well, I can push myself for the kids who look forward to the program. And Kumatani's like, you know, he just seems concerned. He's like, when I see their smiles, I forget about the pains in my body. And at that moment, I was like, well, damn, now it makes sense why Urumichi keeps the job. And based on his relationship with his dad, it would make sense. He's doing the job not only because it lets him act out this persona as a gymnast, which he doesn't seem to be now professionally, but it also gets him a chance to work with kids and have a relationship that he didn't have with his own dad as a kid. And he wants to make an impact on these kids that, you know, may not, may or may not have that same experience either. It's like, oh. So Kumatani knows that he's hurt his back. So I have a feeling that's going to become a plot point. We've got, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12. we got five episodes to go. That's plenty of time for a back hurting plot line to kick in and Urumichi not being able to come to work. Plenty of time for that. I feel for him, though, because... I've had experiences too where I used to work out really hardcore like Urumichi like not not anything like CrossFit or something like that but I used to work out like every single day I ran every single day um and then I would get shin splints or I would get like I'd overcorrect like doing lifting weights and stuff and I would like I've, I've like tore the muscles in like my chest before and the doctor was like stop doing that and I was like but and they were like no so it's so easy if you overdo it it's easier than you think but it isn't something to laugh about because it can really hurt and it can make it to where you can't do that anymore. So Kumatani's kind of being like, you know, maybe you should take better care of your body so that way you can keep doing your job. But yeah, we see this little moment of Uramichi being completely genuine and liking his job. And Kumatani's like, this seems not like him. So I feel like he definitely is going to be telling others about it like Usahara and keeping a watchful eye over him. So then the general manager's son, uh, Augustus Gloop Jr. here, comes up. I, <laughs> of course, he wants to be lifted up. I am a little bit mad at the man with the, the signboards because I feel like they could have maybe done an activity and explained to the kid that they couldn't today. But instead they were like, no, no, he's a general manager's son. We have grandson. We have to let him do it. And it's like, ugh. I felt for Uramichi today that sucked i felt for him he's like up you go and then all these kids are hanging off of him and kumatani's like oh my god urmichi's in trouble and so of course usao finds out they went to get drinks and he's like why didn't you invite me and so uzahara's like oh i went to a girl's bar i don't i didn't know japan had a girl's bar is it like a strip club i don't know it was like a gentleman's club i don't know he's like the girls who work there love my stories okay I think I know what that is because in Buddy Daddies, the main character of Buddy Daddies, he kind of has at the very beginning, this isn't spoiling anything, you find out the first episode, he kind of plays like pachinko or does some gambling, but he goes to a girl's bar and there's a lot of women that work there and he kind of thinks like Usahara that he's real funny and they're liking his jokes. Now in that series, they do kind of like his jokes, but mainly they like taking his money. So... It kind of works out. Uh, Kazuki's character does. But here, I know exactly what they're talking about. I just don't know the details of girls' bars in Japan. I'm like, are they bars that just employ women to serve drinks and provide company? I'm like, is that what this is? So I might have to look that up when this episode's over. Because <laughs> I'm curious. And I'm sure you all will comment down below. But I like that Kumitani is like, those girls want to take your money. Of course they're going to say you're funny. You're probably annoying the hell out of them. And they're just saying it so you'll give them their money and go. I, I love that Kumitani is like the realist. And he's like, no, you're being an idiot. He's like, what does he tell him there? He says, you won't be, you won't be successful without some servility. Unless you yield to your company's unreasonableness. Or you pretend that you're amused by shitty customers' shitty stories. You can't go on living. So he's like, those girls are just humoring you because it's part of their job. The shitty customer who thinks that he's making them laugh with his shitty stories, that's who they're dealing with. He's like, I respect them. And Usara's like, well, no, no, wait, don't put it that way. And that's when the girl asks what servility means. And Kumau deflects that 
question like he was born to deflect it. He was like, oh, I'm only five years old, so I don't understand things, Kuma. And I'm like, that is genius. Because, yeah, they're supposed to be five years old as well, like the kids. So she's like, well, would a 31-year-old know? And he's like, yes. <laughs> so she goes to ask her Amici, who's in the middle of doing, like, a half lunge with these kids just draped over him. And he explains what servility means. He's like, it means to imagine another's feelings. It sounds nice, right? He's like, but you have no choices or autonomy before extensive authority. <laughs> He's like, you basically have to, it means you have to cleverly curry favors with big shots for your job if you want to live to see tomorrow. And she's like, in short, what you're doing right now? And he's like, yes. <laughs> he's like, I have to cater to this little kid so that I can keep my job. He's like, well, since you kids are small, there are times when you feel the adults are talking about something difficult. His whole explanation of the way that we use language to talk and others and confuse others. It's so good. It's so good. Cause here's the thing. I'm an English major, so I feel confident saying this, but when I was in college, it, especially grad school, when you're in undergraduate school, you know, if you're in the U S if you're an undergraduate and you're working on your bachelor's degree, then everybody, even within like the English major, there's lots of concentrations like creative writing or editing or teaching or um, children's literature or young adult literature or um, linguistics or English as a second language. There's all sorts of different avenues with the English department where I went to school at. And when you're an undergrad, you're all just kind of there having fun working on that bachelor's degree. But when you get into grad school, your goals get a lot more, um, I guess serious would be the way to put it. It feels a lot more serious because you're in like a, a graduate level, you're doing something very specific, it's for a higher degree. And so I feel, I often, I often felt in graduate school, and I would tell some of my friends this, and they kind of agreed, that there were some people in the English major in grad school that really tried to put off this posh air, and they tried to use like big fancy words all the time in conversation, but it wasn't, you know, because they were trying to use an expansive vocabulary. It was because they were trying to like deflect or they were trying to like put on this air of elitism or something like that. And my friends and I were like, look, <laughs> we were all in our twenties. I'm like, we're all getting a graduate degree. It's fine. But like, I hate the word facetious. I had like people that I was around all the time in grad school, they'd be like, you're just being facetious. And I'm like, you're just saying that word because it sounds fancy. And I was like, stop it. <laughs> it's like a trigger word. I'm like, stop saying that. Blah. But I do love the conversation that Uramichi has here by saying that, look, paraphrasing things, you make them sound complex. It's like long speeches. They're just there to distract you and just, you know, to make you be deflected from having a, a conversation. They're excuses. And Kumatani he explains to Usahara, he's like, you know, he said something venomless, a nice thing, which he rarely does. It was an ordinary thing, and normally he'd never do anything like that. I thought it was a little creepy, to be honest. But I also think he was speaking from his heart. Even though he's corrupted, he thinks nice words are all lies. No matter how suppressed he is by society or authority, he's desperately trying every day to at least not lose a small amount of conscience he has as a gymnast Onisan. So it's like, no matter how corrupted he thinks the world is, and no matter how he thinks his job is just ridiculous, there is a part of him that's trying to hold on to it because of the good things that it, it brings. And, and Kuma's like, I think he actually believes that. Oh, meanwhile, he gives this beautiful and passionate speech about it. And then Usahara is like, why didn't you take me out for drinks with y'all? And I'm like, Usahara, you didn't get it. You didn't get it. I'm just like, ah. Uh. So then they're like the general manager and Ikateru is like, oh, wait, was that boy and his mom part of the family? And it's like the mom told me earlier she was a fan of mine and asked me for my contacts. And I turned her down, which you know what? I think Kuma would have been proud for him because Ikateru is kind of so cloud headed sometimes that I think if he just handed his personal information out to just anybody who said they liked him, he could end up in a very bad situation. So I'm glad that he said no. I'm glad he was like, no, I don't do that. And then went on his way. And I'm glad that the woman was forgiving and was like, no, I get it. It's fine. 
I was like, somebody could take advantage of you and try to hurt you, Ikateru, and Kuma would not like that. Not one bit. <laughs> oh. I like that she ends up saying he's unexpectedly reserved, and I like it. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> so then we have the mall scene that is Father's Day. And, oh, my God, the scene with the brain age test is one of my worst mall nightmares. You all, I don't know where you all live. Here in the Midwest, malls are kind of if you're in a if you're in a large city, there are still malls. But if you're in a small small rural community, malls don't exist anymore. COVID wiped them out off the map. And that and like mall culture just kind of declined around the 2010s in in where I live. So there is no real mall anymore. You have to go like an hour and a half to find one. But back when the mall was a bustling, when I was in high school, where I lived, my least favorite time to go was like when all of the shops and stands were like in prime hours and there'd always be like a sunglasses hut or like a phone case hut or like a jewelry hut or something like this brain age test. And the people there would be exactly like these people. They'd be like, don't you want to come take the test? And Urmichi like tries to tell him, he's like, I've got to go to work. And they're like, oh, it'll just take five minutes. I'm like, mm -mm. like my parents were like, just, just keep walking. <laughs> don't even look. But yeah, they would be so annoying. And I'd be like, I don't want to talk to you. And you'd almost have to be rude to them because they wouldn't leave you alone. And so then they have him take this brain test and they ask him to lose at rock, paper, scissors, right? And so the thing is paper. So to lose, you pick the scissors. That's the one you pick, which is the first one he picks. And it says it's incorrect. And he's like, but no. So then he chooses the rock and it says no. So then it's like he keeps choosing the, the all the different ones and they just say that he's wrong. And it's like nerve wracking. Like it is, that is true horror. <laughs> But they say he has a 91-year-old's brain, and they give him a balloon, and it's terrifying. So then we get further into the mall, where they're performing like a concert. I think it's interesting that the TV show sets up a concert with the actual actors to come out. I guess since it's local, they can do that. I know that the mall in our area used to have like little concerts with cartoon characters and stuff like that, but it obviously was not the main actors it was just somebody dressed up as them um but here i guess since it's close to the studio they were able to do that but together with pop on meaning together with papa on there so then usahara is trying to convince kumitani that this girl likes him and kumitani looks he always looks every time you see kuma on screen he looks like he's in disbelief he looks like no <laughs> he just looks like he's not having any of it and he's like, oh, hey, Ramichi san this clown's trying to tell me as a girlfriend, how you doing? <laughs> and Usara's like, oh, hey, good morning. And Ramichi just has this, this balloon. It's so stupid. I love it. So then they all, like, come out. And then he's, like, just hitting with the balloon. When Uramichi gets him back for it, it's amazing. I love that he's just like, yes. And he's not even looking at him anymore. It's so funny. So yeah, they have the, the Mayon Mall coming there, a Father's Day special event. Oh my God. So I love this MC and how pushy she is. She was hilarious. And the fact they were like, she is really pushy. She's like the local MC at the mall that she woke up this morning and this was her job and she is so damn happy to do it and she is psyched. I'm like, you know those people though, right? Those people that they're like 150% into this role and they're like... Like, I love how forceful she is. It was really funny in this. But yeah, so they all come out. And Urumichi has the dead shark eyes, but he puts on the happy face. And then he's talking about the kit, what they're going to do. And then the one kid in the front row speaks up and says, thank you. I like how they animated the dad. The dad was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, even when it gets awkward, he's like, oh, this is weird. But they animated him really well. And the kid says, my dad is always busy, but he made an exception today and took the day off to take me to see you because of that I can spend time with him today and then Urumichi like actually cries because of that and at that point I was like oh this isn't a joke he really got touched in that moment because it came up again and so there's the idea that Urumichi probably didn't have a good relationship with his dad obviously not after the drawing 
but that he probably wanted to spend time with his dad and then it didn't end up happening. It's oof, oof. There's a lot of stuff going on there. So then the MC's like, well, we're going to have drawings to show off their dads to you. And they show off all the dads at first that the kids did. And now they want them to, to draw. And she's like, would you like to see the Oni-san and their friends' as father? And they're like, like, she's really forceful. We didn't know this was part of the contract. My thing is Usahara and Kamau forgetting to make their characters into rabbits and bears. I'm like, y'all know better. Y'all know better, right? I want to see what their drawings were of of them and the kid asks Urimichi they're like will I come to dislike him because you talk about not seeing your dad in a while and for him to say no you won't you'll just feel a little awkward and the dad's like oh ha, 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 ha. like for Urimichi to not answer that question with yeah you'll hate him because at this point it's almost like he's indifferent at this point he's kind of like well what do you think you're gonna do right oh my gosh it just kind of broke my heart at the end of this episode. So then we see the dads. Um, it looks like Kuma Kumatani's dad is a chef. He has like a, a, a knife and he has like an apron and stuff on. Like he's a chef at a restaurant. And then it looks like uh, Usahara's dad works at a liquor store. So there you go. Interesting. And of course they forget to put the hat, the ears and the, the on them. And the kids are like, they look like people. Like, I was thinking too much about my father, who I haven't seen in a long time. Oh, and it's like, I drew him intently. Then we see Urimichi's dad, and we see him throwing Urimichi as a kid away and holding up the sister by her back. And they didn't even know that he had a sister. And he talks about her leaving when she was 16, leaving the house. So the older sister we don't know anything about. And we just see him as the, as the boy getting thrown away. And the dad's this big muscular man that kind of looks like Urimichi. I wasn't ready for it to get this real. I wasn't ready for the realness. I was not. And they're like, what is this? Why is it scary? What's going on? He's like, my father was strict. And if I was small and I skipped training, he'd throw me onto a mat. And then he's like, my sister left home at the age of 16 as if to escape from him. And they're like, oh, we didn't even know you had a sister. And then the kid says, you don't hate your dad when he's like that? And Ermichi says, if I hadn't been born as a son of a father like him, then I'm sure I wouldn't be here. So you can only live once no matter what. So you sometimes think that you made a mistake even when you don't know if it was really a mistake. But if you can feel that you're happy in the end, even if it's just a little, then I'm certain you didn't make a mistake. Whether your parents' mistakes can be over... This is the part that got me. Whether your parents' mistakes can be overturned or not depends on how you kids live your life in the future. And that gets me so emotional even now because it's for Uramichi who feels so corrupted and feels like... He doesn't have anything really going for him and he feels so miserable so much for him when it comes down to like, well, do you want to blame it on your dad? And he's like, no, he's like, no, cause I wouldn't be here otherwise. And he's like, what I do now is going to be depending on what my future is. He's not depending on what my future is. And I'm like, like teaching these kids being like, don't blame your parents for the things in your life just work to be a better person and then you'll find your own happiness. And I like that. Like maybe when to break down, I was like, Oh no, I didn't want to cry in this episode, but damn, damn, you may not be able to live for someone else, but it'd be nice if you choose to live in a way in which you don't blame others. Life lessons with Uramichi Onisan. Oh, that just broke my heart. I was like, damn. And that's where you ended. That's so huge for Uramichi to be like, for him to say that he's not going to blame, that he's not going to blame his dad. I don't know if we'll get to see him or his sister before the end of the season. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But that suddenly added so much context to this entire series and everything that he's doing and the reason why he's doing it. 
Wild. Wild, y'all. Just absolutely wild. Yep. So we go after there, and they're all getting ready to go, and Usahara, like, wants to go out and get drinks, and I like that Uramichi asked him to play rock, paper, scissors with him to prove that he was doing it the right way. And he does it the same way that Uramichi did. And he's like, well, what game is this? It's super easy. And he's like, no, you're gonna take the, you're gonna take the balloon. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Love it. And Kumatani's like, I'm not playing this game with you all. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Well, I can honestly say that the rule of eight did not let us down. Mm -mm. Not one bit. No way. That was a really, really good episode. And I about cried. And I feel like we know Uramichi more and more. So, success. <laughs> but I am so excited to hear what you thought down below. What you think of all this. And yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care, and I will be back next week with episode 9 of Life Lessons with Uramichi Onisan.